All right, welcome back, everyone. We're your hosts, Taylor Vido. And Jen York. Great to have you with us yet again. Maybe you're in your car. Maybe you're doing chores. I don't know. I, I listen to podcasts mostly while I'm driving, long road trips. What about you, Jen? Oh, I do it a lot while cooking, driving. Okay. Doing uh, meaningless chores around the house. I'm a kind of a music person when I'm doing that stuff, but I like podcasts while driving. Commuting really makes the trip go by. But yeah. hey, to each their own, I guess, right? Yeah, and hopefully this story makes whatever you're doing go by quickly. So where are we at uh, in, in this series? So let's pick up on this story now that has the attention of police in several states across the West Coast. And it cl- includes Arizona, Idaho, and Hawaii. Now, on the outside, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell appear to be a happy couple. They've just tied the knot on a beach in Kauai. But that was all about to change as the mother and her new husband, a doomsday author from Idaho, are suddenly thrust into the nationwide spotlight. This is One Foot in the Grave. All right, who is Chad Daybell? Chad was born August 8th, 1968. According to his LinkedIn page, Chad studied at Brigham Young University, where he met his wife, Tammy. Now, that's a private research university owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and it's located in Utah. Family described Tammy as a smart, kind woman with a passion for reading, Her family says they fell in love quickly. And just five days after her 20th birthday in 1990, Chad and Tammy get married. The two go on to have five kids. They moved around a few times over the years, but eventually settled in southern Idaho in 2015. Now, Tammy is known as this all-around rock star. Family members describe her as extremely bright and very focused on her family. They say she excelled in school, in the arts, and was most known for her kindness. Families say at one point she supported their young family, too, while Chad continued his schooling. Now, once he graduated, she became a stay-at-home mom, but was heavily involved in church groups and activities for her kids. And from everything I've read, she is described as just this bright presence, just very gifted with a deep love for her family. Now, researching information on the couple's children has been somewhat challenging, but we do know that Tammy and Chad had two girls and three boys, Garth, Emma, Seth, Leah, and Mark. And doing some online sleuthing as the journalists that we are, we were able to learn Seth is an illustrator. Yeah, it kind of sounds like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? Right. So family members say, among other things, Tammy was a very talented artist. She even picks up some graphic design jobs in the early 2000s. And it appears she may have passed that on to her kids. So as of this recording, you can still see Seth's work on Instagram. Now, they're somewhat cartoonish. They're usually a solid color background with a colorful image or two. But he describes his illustrations as fun designs that you can wear around your grandma. So very wholesome. Now, according to East Idaho News, Emma was a third grade teacher in Rexburg. Though looking at the staff page at her last known elementary school, she's no longer listed. But also you can probably relate some of this back to Tammy as well. Families say Tammy worked as a librarian and instilled a love of reading amongst her kids. Now, families say Mark is involved with the LDS Church. He's serving on a mission in South Africa. And information on the other two kids, Aaliyah and Garth, is a bit more scarce. But you can see them pictured in a family photo on Seth's Facebook page. So, what was life like initially for the Daybell family? Chad, Tammy, and their kids moved around Utah at times along the I-15 corridor. And that's the freeway that runs through Salt Lake City and then to eastern Idaho at one point. But let's focus on Springville, Utah. That's where Tammy went to high school. Springville is essentially a suburban bedroom community located just south of Provo. And again, Provo is where BYU is and where she and Chad met. They moved to Ogden, Utah, which is north of Salt Lake City after he graduated, and the Daybell family started to grow there. But they then moved back to Springville, and it seems that's where the family definitely continued to lay down roots, and it no doubt appears to be a family-friendly city. Its population is around 33,000 people. 
An overhead shot of town shows clusters of neighborhoods with fields not far in the distance. And then there's the backdrop. Springville sits at the base of the Wasatch Mountains. It's very pretty, and the mountains are certainly a key feature. The city definitely has somewhat of a suburban feel with no tall buildings, some pizza joints, family restaurants. There's a Walmart on the western edge of town just off the freeway. There are a few classic Old West brick buildings along the main street, though, almost seeming to add to that kind of comfortable small town feel of a community in the Rockies. So Springville is just five miles south of Provo and BYU. Its nickname is Art City. In this cozy suburb is the Springville Museum of Art, Utah's first fine arts museum, we should note. It sits in an old, classic-looking Spanish-style building that has over 2,500 works. So, Tammy first worked as a secretary in the Parks Department in Springville. When the family moved back later, she then worked as a computer teacher at Art City Elementary. A write-up of a fifth-grade concert from 2011 on the school's website describes kids as performing a song called Typewriter and that was a tribute to what they learned from Mrs. Daybell in computer class. So, backed on his LinkedIn page, Chad during this time is working as an author, and he had founded a publishing company and then a book company. Tammy helped out with that as well. So, now we want to fast forward to 2015. That's when the family moves to Rexburg, Idaho, settling in on the outskirts of town, to be specific. And like Springville, Rexburg's population is similar in size at around 25,000 people, but Rexburg isn't a bedroom community. It's the largest city of Madison County and is also the county seat. Rexburg is a little bit more flat. However, mountains can be seen much further off in the distance. But there's certainly plenty of farms and fields around town. And it's almost like Rexburg is a farm town that's grown over time. And that growth, we can assume, can be attributed in part to BYU-Idaho. It's located in Rexburg and became a four-year college just 20 years ago. So going off that, there's another prominent feature in Rexburg. It's LDS Temple. The large white building and its spire are certainly very noticeable in town. And for those not familiar with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, temples are different than churches. You know, the LDS Church has churches as well, but temples are, as I understand it, essentially used for certain church activities. Okay, so back in Rexburg, its temple opened in 2008 and became the third temple built in Idaho. So it's safe to say that Rexburg has a large LDS population. Madison County is nearly 80% LDS, according to data compiled by Slate.com. So the Daybells and their kids settle in, and Tammy works as a librarian for a couple of schools in the area. Chad continues his career as an author, and we have gotten some glimpses of the Daybell home this year. It's in a semi-rural area where homes appear to sit on at least a few acres of land, if not more. There are neighboring homes nearby. The Daybell house is a single-level brick mid-century. It's pretty modest-looking and isn't massive or huge or anything like that. If you look at the home on Google Street View, you can see there's a large tree in the front yard with a rope swing. Kind of a classic-looking American house, you know? Like your everyday American house. Yeah. In his adult life, Chad is known for his esoteric books, and he's a well-known doomsday prepper. Now, he's also a podcaster who talks about some near-death experiences. According to his biography in one of his books, he says the experiences left him with one foot in this world and one foot in the next. He also claims to have so-called contacts in the next world. And he says the end of the world is coming soon and people should be preparing now. And that means things like stockpiling food and supplies until the chosen ones are taken to heaven. There you go. So we've mentioned that Chad Daybell is an author, but we also wanted to look up some of these books and look at some of these passages. So based on what's listed of his online, Daybell certainly appears to have been quite an author. And you can actually go to Amazon and buy several books of his still. There are more than one dozen of them on there. His oldest work on the website dates back to 2003. His most recent work, based on what's posted on Amazon, was published in July of 2019. And Daybell has his own website, too. Any guesses on what that address might be, Jen? I have so many guesses, but what is it? Uh, His own website is just cdaybell.com. He keeps it simple. That's underwhelming. (laughs) Keeps it straightforward. (laughs) Uh, So, but this website has posts on it well before the Lori Vallow story broke. So, cdaybell.com divides his works into four categories. 
two have titles. There's the Times of Turmoil series and the Standing in Holy Places series. And his other two categories are nonfiction titles and children's books. And here's something I didn't know. Chad Daybell wrote kids' books as well. My eyebrows raised a little. Okay, though, mm -hmm. continue. What are they about? So one's about the Apostle John and his relationship to Jesus. Another is called I Know the Modern Prophets, and it's about LDS leaders as kids. Here's the question. That book about LDS leaders as kids, do you think that was the book that uh, got Laurie Vallow hooked on his works? Oh, that's a lot of questions. I, <laughs> You know, it's hard to tell. Maybe not, but hey, who knows? Um, so going back to his, uh, his, his different books, his Times of Turmoil series has four books, and they appear to be nonfiction. A description on his website for the first book, Evading Babylon, reads in part, quote, In the near future, the world as we know it will suddenly change. Natural disasters will lead to economic difficulties, leaving the United States on the edge of collapse. During this time of strife, members of the LDS Church will be invited by their leaders to survive the civil unrest by gathering to holy refuges. Amazon actually has a preview of the audiobook for Evading Babylon. Here's a clip. Nathan refocused on Elder Smith's words, who said, The members of the church will soon face some life-changing decisions. We'll all encounter a variety of difficulties as the second coming approaches, but the key is to obey the prophet no matter what comes our way. Those saints who disregard his words will find themselves in both physical and spiritual peril. So Amazon lists that narrator you just heard as Seth Daybell, one of his five kids. Now, Seth appears to be in his late 20s, perhaps. He's a clean-cut guy, modest-looking, with glasses. Seth is the son with a graphic design company and makes family-friendly t-shirts, as we've talked about. It's worth noting that his late mom, Tammy, designed some of the book covers for Chad. Seth has a wife and a young kid, and he's not mentioned much in news coverage, but a March 2020 story from a Phoenix TV station mentioned Seth as living at the Daybell house outside of Rexburg at the time. He came out to get mail and declined to speak with reporters. But, okay, back to the books. Three books follow in the Times of Turmoil series, and they're all about the U.S. being in turmoil or under attack, according to Daybell's website. Other books talk about the Savior's second coming and New Jerusalem, but the book that's first listed on his website is an apparent autobiographical work called Living on the Edge of Heaven. Now, this is the work that talks about, as you mentioned, Jen, living partially in another world or dimension. And here's a summary for Living on the Edge of Heaven. It reads, quote, When Chad Daybell was 17 years old, he had a near-death experience while cliff jumping. He crossed into another dimension and realized there was a world beyond this one. A second near-death experience in his early 20s was much more in-depth. He was hit hard by a monstrous wave at La Jolla Cove in California. While his body was being tossed by the wave, his spirit was visited by his grandfather, who showed him future events involving his still-unborn children. This accident caused his veil that separates mortal life from the spirit world to stay partially open, so he often feels as if he has a foot in both worlds. So that was the description for his book, Living on the Edge of Heaven. Another book of his is called One Foot in the Grave, The Strange but True Adventures of a Cemetery Sextant. And that one's about graveyard stories from a cemetery worker along with, hey, no surprise, Daybell's personal experience with, quote, meddling spirits. Sounds like an interesting read, huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's just uh, a cemetery worker. And meddling spirits. Yeah, and okay. going back to his books on Amazon, the customer the customer reviews are fairly mixed for all his works. Now, granted, hey, to begin with, Amazon reviews are already kind of a crapshoot. That's you know a whole other discussion topic. And at the same time, I'd also imagine that once the news of his alleged involvement in the Vallow case came out, some reviewers with a vengeance went online and started reviewing his works. For Living on the Edge of Heaven, a customer submitted image of the book is actually a photo of Daybell and Lori Vallow at an airport. And one review for the book reads, quote, don't buy this book because Lori Vallow's new husband is Chad Daybell. In January 2020, Chad's younger brother, Mark, made a rare public statement to the East Idaho News about Chad. He described their relationship as strained, saying he and his family have actually had very little association with Chad for several years. And he says this is due to concerns with Chad's extreme religious claims and the particular books he had chosen to publish. And so this kind of makes us wonder, where was Chad Daybell getting all of this? 
And how did his religion work into these books? Well, clearly Daybell has a background in the LDS church, but it appears that a lot of his beliefs were his own and he was developing his own ideas. So the website eastidahonews.com, we should mention they've done a lot of great reporting about this. They've interviewed some of the people who were in the same circles as Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. And they pointed out that the couple were part of several small groups and weren't necessarily part of a large cult or anything like that. And one woman who spoke with East Idaho News said that cult wasn't necessarily an appropriate word, but rather extremist group. Another said Daybell didn't have a big group of followers in eastern Idaho, but rather spoke with several small groups and shared his story. And I think that's a key point worth looking at. Keep in mind, Daybell had started his own book company, so it's not like he was writing for another publisher or was a official LDS writer, if that were to be a thing. Again, his own books, his own company. And here's something else. Another woman who was in the same circles as Daybell said he essentially taught people about reincarnation, and reincarnation is not a commonly accepted LDS belief. East Idaho News also reported that a woman Daybell published books for was eventually excommunicated from the LDS church. That woman also wrote books about having a close connection to the spirit world due to near-death experiences. So. Looking at all this, clearly it appears that Daybell was really on the fringes of the religion. Up With Creme is the only four-hour newscast in the Inland Northwest, so you can tune in when it works for you. You're going to know what weather is going to impact your day and how you can plan around it. Every morning we celebrate what makes this the Inland North best. When you watch Up With Creme, you are in the driver's seat. So join in the conversation. Just text us. Monday through Friday, we're spending our mornings with you. We'll see you on Creme and the CW22. In 2018, friends say Lori Vallow met Chad during a conference and a book signing in Utah. And you might remember in our last episode, Lori's friends say she became increasingly obsessed with his books. Friends say the two actually hit it off at this signing and over time they grew closer. And in court documents, police allege Chad started teaching Lori about zombies in early 2019. Police say he taught her zombies can invade someone's physical body. And the only way to release that person's true soul from limbo is to kill their physical body. Now at this point, Chad is married to his wife, Tammy. Meanwhile, Lori's estranged husband had just filed for divorce. And a few months later in July, it's when Lori's brother shot and killed her soon-to-be ex-husband. Just three months later, on October 19, 2019, tragedy strikes Chad's family. Tammy, his wife of nearly 30 years and mother to his five children, suddenly dies. Her obituary reads she died peacefully in her sleep, and at the time, medical experts say she died of natural causes. She was only 49 years old. Aunt Tammy was buried in Springville, Utah, near her parents' home, on October 22, 2019. That's three days after her premature death. Okay, so when I hear that, for an unexpected death, or maybe any death, three days from death to being put in the ground, essentially— kind of seems quick, and her obituary says there was a viewing, a service, and that they then transferred her remains across state line for burial in Utah. And one would think you might want to take some more time to plan all that out, not make it so rushed in a sense, right? It seems for someone, I think someone argue 49 is a fairly young age, and it's Agreed. an unexpected death, so... You know, uh, some people may plan for those things and have it all played, you know, planned out for when their time comes. You know, I've volunteered in the funeral service before the family member who's a mortician. And uh, there's been a number of death calls that I've volunteered for that are unexpected. All deaths unexpected, of course, but let's say younger people. And it took some time for people to get that together and you make a plan and how they're going to uh, process that. Of course, it's traumatic. Some people just need time to process what's going on. Of course, again, not the case for every death, but I know from my experience being 
my limited, you know, time in that uh, sector or that field, it seems like it's pretty quick for, for people. Uh, approximately two weeks after the death of his wife on November 5th, Chad marries Lori in Hawaii. Now, all seems well with these newly married widowers, and they spend some time in Hawaii before returning to Idaho. But it's at this same time that Lori has no idea that she's already on police's radar. They actually started surveilling her movements before the wedding. Get this, stemming from the attempted murder of her niece's estranged husband, Brandon. Now, prior to Lori and Chad's wedding, he was the target of a drive-by shooting. Now, Arizona police were able to trace the suspect's vehicle, saying it was registered. Want to take a guess? To who? Uh, Charles Vallow. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, you nailed it. So, but we know it can't be Charles because he died in July when Lori's brother, Alex, shot and killed him. So later in court documents, though, Brandon alleges during their divorce and custody battle, Lori's niece planned to kill him with the help of none other than Uncle Alex, the same man who also killed Charles, Lori's husband. How many characters are there in this story? It's like quite the family. Yeah, it's it's just going to get a lot bigger from here. So Alex Cox is a name investigators in Idaho would soon become too familiar with. In the coming months, just a few weeks later, one phone call led to a number of lies, a multi-state search, and a very grisly discovery. Additional sources for this episode of One Foot in the Grave includes GTVB, a Techna company, and music by Jason Gray. <laughs>